It was a hot summer day on July 8, 1987, when the people of Carlsbad, New Mexico were shaken to the core. The reason? The body of 38-year-old Donna Sue Hyatt was discovered in her home on Elm Street. The crime was unimaginable and there were signs that she had been assaulted as well as being stabbed and strangled prior to her demise. The whole community of Carlsbad was left in shock, wondering who could have committed such a heinous act against an innocent woman. How did the police crack the case after all these years? Today, we are looking at the 36-year-old cold case finally solved in 2023 of the murder of Donna Sue Hyatt. But first, if you haven't subscribed to our channel, please hit the subscribe and like buttons. Now without any further ado, let's dive into the mystery. Carlsbad, a city nestled in the southeastern region of New Mexico, is renowned for its breathtaking scenery of caves, limestone cliffs, and desert landscapes adorned with cacti. The Carlsbad Caverns National Park with over 100 limestone caves displaying distinct formations serves as a safe haven for nature enthusiasts worldwide, such as rock climbing and ATV tours while also exploring the local history exhibits featured in several art galleries. However, the city's idyllic reputation was shattered when a heinous crime took place, leaving its residents in fear and disbelief. Donna Sue Hyatt's birth on August 28, 1948 was a momentous occasion for her parents, who eagerly welcomed their new daughter into the world. Growing up, Donna shared a close bond with her sisters, Marlene Johnson and Sandra Daniel, and they spent countless hours playing together around the house. Donna's education began at the local schools in Carlsbad, where she excelled in her studies and developed a passion for learning. She went on to pursue higher education at New Mexico State University, where she continued to thrive academically and personally. Outside of her studies, Donna was an active member of both the First Baptist Church and the Christian Women's Club, dedicating her time to serving her community and living out her faith. Her kind and generous nature endeared her to those around her, and she quickly became a beloved member of both organizations. She shared a deep love with her husband, and their daughter Angela was the shining star of their lives. However, tragedy struck when Angela stumbled upon a gruesome sight in their bedroom. Her mother lay lifeless and partially clothed. The sheer horror of the scene was overwhelming for Angela, who had to witness the unthinkable happening to her beloved mother. Despite her bright future and the joy that she brought to those around her, Donna's life was tragically cut short, leaving her family and friends devastated by their loss. The pain of saying goodbye to someone so full of potential was a heartbreak that they would carry with them for the rest of their lives. The sun beat down on the quiet town of Carlsbad with its usual relentless heat. As the day wore on, Donna Sue Hyatt went about her usual routine, carrying out household chores and attending to her daily responsibilities. However, as night crept in, a sense of foreboding began to settle in the air. Little did she know that tragedy lurked in the shadows, waiting to strike. At around 11.40 p.m., Donna's daughter, Angela, arrived home to find a harrowing scene. Her mother's lifeless body, on the floor, surrounded by bruises and stab wounds. The shock and disbelief that engulfed Angela were almost too much to bear as she struggled to come to terms with the horrifying reality before her. After taking a moment to collect herself, Donna's daughter realized that she needed to take action. She knew that she had to alert authorities right away. Without hesitation, she dialed the emergency number and informed the dispatcher of the grim discovery. The police were dispatched to the scene immediately. The investigation was a mystery that baffled the entire Carlsbad community. The city was in shock when the news of the death of a young woman hit the headlines. The Carlsbad Police Department detectives were quick to respond to the crime scene as soon as they were notified. The detectives cautiously entered the home and began their investigation. The detectives were quick to take control of the scene. They combed through the scene of the crime collecting valuable evidence including four and hoping it would be useful later in the investigation. Upon investigation, detectives learned that Donna was last seen in the company of a tall Caucasian man who was seen leaving a nearby store on foot around 9.15 p.m. on the day of her untimely death. This crucial piece of information became the starting point of the detectives' investigation and they worked tirelessly to identify the man and uncover any other leads that could help solve the case. As the investigation into Donna's tragic death continued, the Carlsbad Police Department detectives meticulously interviewed all involved parties, witnesses, and family members to piece together the sequence of events. But they were unable to turn up any solid leads to follow. An advanced technology at the time proved to be a major roadblock in bringing justice to the Hyatt family. As a result, the case went cold and justice seemed like a distant dream for the family of Donna Sue Hyatt and the Carlsbad community as a whole. 
In 2023, Detective Joey Landgraf and Detective Tim Nice, both from the Carlsbad Police Department, the 36-year-old cold homicide case and embarked on a mission to identify the perpetrator. With the help of new investigative techniques, they were able to unlock valuable leads and send the crime scene evidence collected all those years ago to Othram, where advanced DNA sequencing was conducted using forensic-grade genome sequencing to build a comprehensive DNA profile of the suspect. The FBI's forensic genetic genealogy team used this DNA profile to develop leads. And after reviewing both new and existing evidence, Landgraf and Nice pinpointed a man named Michael Ruff Wigley as the prime suspect in this case. But how could they confirm their suspicions? They looked further into his past to find if he was in Carlsbad around the time of the assault and murder. The detectives were able to match his description with that of the suspect provided by the witnesses earlier in the investigation, further solidifying Wigley as a prime suspect in the case. The detectives made a significant breakthrough by identifying Wigley as a person of interest. Through extensive research, the Carlsbad Police Department determined that Michael Ruff Wigley was indeed present in Carlsbad during the time of the assault and murder of Donna. This discovery led them down a path of further investigation, ultimately uncovering Wigley's past criminal record and his connection to this case. Upon delving deeper into Wigley's profile, detectives unearthed a shocking fact about Michael Ruff Wigley's past. He had been investigated for two separate incidents of sexual assault in Central Texas in the early 1980s, and he was ultimately convicted and sentenced to prison for one of those incidents. This revelation shed new light on the case and helped detectives understand the gravity of the situation they were dealing with. The investigation took an unexpected turn when they discovered that Michael Ruff Wigley had passed away in a traffic accident in 1989 after his release from prison. Undeterred, they obtained a search warrant for Wigley's exhumation and DNA collection and with the support of Amarillo, Texas law enforcement executed the search warrant with precision and care. The collected DNA samples were then subjected to the KINSNP testing by Othram, which definitively identified Wigley as the culprit behind Donna Sue Hyatt's murder in July 1987. The detectives went above and beyond by not only relying on DNA evidence to solve the case, but also conducting interviews with witnesses and family members. Through their diligent work, they were able to further confirm Wigley's presence in Carlsbad at the time of the assault and murder, solidifying his guilt beyond a shadow of a doubt. The partnership between the Carlsbad Police Department's detectives and Othram Lab, a private lab based in Texas, marks a notable development in forensic science and crime scene investigation. By conducting DNA testing, the detectives were able to compare DNA samples collected from the crime scene to those obtained from the exhumed remains of Wigley, the suspect. While it may seem like a difficult feat to close such an old unsolved case, the detectives' unwavering commitment and persistence allowed them to successfully bring justice to the Hyatt family and the community. The process not only brought closure to the family but also served as a testament to the detectives' dedication to their work. The impact of this achievement also reverberated beyond the case, as it restored the community's trust in law enforcement and highlighted the value of cooperation and innovation in the fight against crime. The memories of that fateful night still lingered in the minds of the officers and detectives who had responded to the scene back in 1987. They had worked tirelessly to preserve the crime scene's integrity, collecting every potential piece of evidence that could aid in the investigation. It was their diligence and dedication that proved to be the difference maker as their work enabled officers to bring closure to the case almost four decades later. Carlsbad Mayor Dale Janway made sure to recognize the effort of these officers and detectives acknowledging their hard work and commitment to the case. The city of Carlsbad also stepped up, providing financial assistance to ensure that the DNA in the case could be tested and analyzed. It is our sincere hope that the recent efforts and the efforts of those involved in 1987 can bring some small form of peace and closure to the family of Donna Sue Hyatt and the community of Carlsbad, Janway said. When do you think justice was served in this case? At the time of Wigley's demise? Or after he was charged with the crime after his death so many years later? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section. With a loving husband and a two-year-old boy, Yvonne Scruggs was living a happy and peaceful life in Travis Drive, Wisconsin. Everything seemed to be working out fine and the family was stronger than ever. 
However, the happiness they had was short-lived as Yvonne found her 29-year-old husband, Benny Scruggs, stabbed to death in the early morning hours of July 17, 1985. The police on investigating uncovered many secrets. However, they had no idea that it would take more than 35 years for the case to be solved. Who could have been the killer? Was it just another murder? Or was there something else going on? Today, we will be unraveling the cold case of Benny Scruggs, who was stabbed to death in 1985. Before starting, we would like you to take a moment and hit the like and subscribe buttons. Also, press the bell icon to be the first to discover all new cold cases. Let us now take a stroll through this atrocious cold case. The city of Wisconsin Rapids serves as the county seat of Wisconsin's Wood County in the U.S. Life here is a harmonious blend of small-town charm and modern conveniences where neighbors greet each other with genuine smiles and lend a helping hand when needed. It is a tapestry of diverse communities where friendships flourish and traditions are cherished. Whether it's cheering on the local sports team, participating in community festivals, or simply enjoying the tranquility of the nearby natural wonders, living in Wisconsin Rapids offers a fulfilling and enriching experience. Moreover, given that there are 1.71 violent crimes per 1,000 residents in this area, it offers a safe environment. However, no city in this world is totally free from atrocities. When Benny Scruggs was savagely killed in Wisconsin Rapids, the city became a setting for one of the longest cold cases in the city's history. Benny Eugene Scruggs was born on August 18, 1956, in Pickens, South Carolina, in the United States. He was the third child in Garvin and Rudy Scruggs' family, and he grew up with his older sister Ansel, his older brother Wayne, and his little sister Kim. However, not much is known about his childhood. On May 15, 1982, Benny, at the age of 25, got married to Yvonne Koba in Easley, South Carolina. It was a successful marriage, and after a year into the marriage, in 1983, Yvonne gave birth to a baby boy and named him Matthew. It was July 16, 1985, and Benny and Yvonne went out to eat and have some drinks at Lance's Never Inn, a local restaurant. While they were gone, they requested their babysitter to watch after Matthew, their two-year-old son. The babysitter looked after the youngster until they came home at 1 a.m. According to the babysitter, the couple returned home that night in exceptionally high spirits. Bidding goodbye to her, the couple headed to bed. What exactly transpired after that remained a mystery? However, all the scenarios end with the same climax, the death of Benny Scruggs. On July 17, 1985, at around 3 in the morning, the police received a call from a man named Brian Walker. He informed the police about Benny and requested their presence immediately. When the police asked for more information about the situation on their way, he stated that he was Benny's neighbor and had been summoned by Benny's wife, Yvonne. When he arrived, he noticed that Benny had been stabbed. Brian continued saying that Benny was hardly breathing and bleeding profusely. The officers urged him to continue applying pressure to the area in order to halt the bleeding. He responded that he was holding a knife because the murderer might still be there. The cops were aware of the situation and understood how anxious he would be, so they calmed him down first and urged him to put the knife aside and instead apply pressure to the wound. The man yelled out to Yvonne and instructed her to apply pressure to Benny's bleeding area. Over the phone, the officers also heard Yvonne mention that one of her butcher knives had gone missing. The Wisconsin police soon reached Benny's residence in Pioneer Village Mobile Home Park, 1310 29th Avenue South in Travis Drive. Benny was lying on the waterbed at his trailer home, covered with blood, with a towel over the wound. Then the ambulance arrived at the scene, and it was declared by a coroner that Benny was no more. The police sent his body for an autopsy, and the cause of death was determined to be a single knife wound to the upper left side of the chest. The medical examiner, Dr. Robert Huntington III, stated that the murder weapon was a hell of a big knife. He told the investigators that the weapon was possibly a large butcher's knife. Benny was stabbed in his sleep, according to Huntington, since he had no defense wounds on his hands or arms. The knife had sliced through his left lung, between two vertebrae and into the last layer of flesh on his back. He also stated that if the knife had been even a quarter inch longer, there would have been a hole in the waterbed. When the detectives spoke with Ivan, they discovered that the knife that had gone missing from their kitchen suited the description of the murder weapon quite accurately. That led to an exhaustive search for the murder weapon. Police emptied a pond in search of the weapon near Pioneer Village, the mobile home park where Benny resided, but no knife was found. Volunteer divers from the Central Wisconsin Diving Academy also aided authorities in their hunt for the knife on July 22, 1985, but to no avail. 
Benny was buried in Restlawn Memorial Park, located in Wisconsin Rapids, Wood County, USA the following week. During the initial interview, Benny's wife, Yvonne, who was 21 at the time, indicated that she had heard her kids screaming from another room and had gone there to comfort him. She went on to say that she had fallen asleep in her son's room. She returned to the bedroom where Benny was sleeping when she woke up. Only then did she come to know that Benny had been stabbed while she was away. However, this was not the only statement she made. After the first interview when her presence was requested for a follow-up interview, Yvonne stated something a bit different. She told detectives that Benny had gone to sleep after the babysitter departed, but she didn't. After some time, she heard her two-year-old son wailing. Since she was already awake, she went to check on the toddler and spent 10 minutes in his room. On her way back to the bedroom where Benny was sleeping, she noticed something was wrong as she found an unusual shovel sitting against the fridge and the caravan door open. The Scruggs family did not own a shovel, so Yvonne quickly rushed to check on Benny. She saw her husband lying in a pool of blood. Witnessing the horrific sight, she summoned her neighbor Brian to assist her. After the second interview, the investigators overheard Yvonne telling her friends that I was asleep next to him, he got stabbed, I don't know it. In the next recounting, Yvonne stated that Benny was on the opposite side of the bed from where he was discovered. Yvonne stated in her final interview of the evening that she and Benny had fallen asleep together and she woke up to find him vomiting and their son coming into their room crying. Yvonne's statement kept changing throughout the interviews. All of these shifting comments made the detective's job uselessly complex. They were forced to believe that Yvonne didn't want to help them crack the case. As a result, they began to focus on additional remarks made by a neighbor, Donald Meyer. Although few people knew anything that might have aided in the investigation, the authorities considered Donald Meyer's testimony to be crucial, and her 10-year-old son near Benny and Yvonne's residence. On or about August 10, 1985, Meyer, an important figure in this gripping tale, confided in one of the witnesses, revealing intriguing connections to the victim Benny Scruggs. Claiming to have known Benny for only a brief period, he said that their acquaintance arose from a car purchase and a motorcycle sale. Yet an intriguing twist emerged as Benny disclosed his prior connection to Benny's wife, Yvonne Scruggs, stretching back to their high school days. Interestingly, their paths crossed again. Meyer and Yvonne had been co-workers at the Woolco store four or five years ago. Meyer said that Yvonne believed he did not do right with her during the school time, but she was determined to have him back. Took a personal turn in no time, involving a romantic involvement. She used to provide Meyer with rides home, often pausing on a secluded dirt road for intimate encounters. He continued to mention that Yvonne had a bad temper and he wouldn't be surprised if she was the one behind Benny's murder. Prior to Benny's murder, Yvonne had allegedly been confiding in Meyer, venting her frustrations about her husband. The once fiery passion between Ivan and Benny had waned. She claimed to have lost the fizz, a phrase Meyer interpreted as her having lost her feelings for Benny. The tension escalated in the days leading up to Benny's tragic demise. Three days before he was found dead, Benny approached Meyer and revealed Ivan's incessant mention of Meyer's name, fueling Benny's ire. Both men perceived it as an intentional attempt to make him jealous and provoke him. He stated that he had last seen Ivan in February 1985 and mentioned that the last time they met Ivan had invited him over while Benny was out. They used their personal time pretty well and had fun in the living room. Yvonne reminded him that if he ever wanted to be with her, he already knew how to get rid of Benny. These remarks by Meyer fundamentally changed the course of the case. Yvonne was confronted by the police with Meyer's comments during an interview in August 1985. Yvonne verified Meyer's account, claiming she didn't inform the cops about her connection with Meyer because she didn't think it was relevant to the investigation, also because she was embarrassed. However, she denied ever hinting at getting rid of Benny. Soon the suspicions started revolving around Yvonne and the detectives delved deep to uncover any information that would shed light on their concerns. On August 20, 1987, Detective Bruce Malaric and Detective Exner met with Cynthia A. Reese, who had been a high school acquaintance of she mentioned that she and Ivan were in the Wood County Courthouse for a social service function in May 1985. When Benny and Ivan entered the room, Ivan approached Cynthia, lowered her face towards her ear, spewed crude remarks about Benny, and then revealed that he had discovered her lover. However, she said it wasn't a matter of great concern for her as she and Benny wouldn't be together for much longer. After this cryptic sentence, Yvonne went away and contacted Cynthia roughly two months after Benny's death. She inquired whether she had heard about Benny's murder, which Cynthia had. Yvonne shared that everyone thought she had killed Benny. 
When Cynthia asked her if she did, Yvonne did not reply. Another witness who knew the Scruggs reported that Yvonne told her that she knew who when the witness questioned her about why she didn't report the incident to the police, she reaffirmed that she knew who was responsible but couldn't turn him in. That statement raised suspicions on Ivan and the police started believing that she must have been involved in the crime somehow. All these eyebrow-raising comments from Ivan kept the investigators on edge. They continued for a few years. The case got cold after 1993 until new testimonies from Meyer in 2012 gave the case new life. While the case was winding down, Meyer piled on an extensive list of criminal charges while Yvonne, on the other hand, got remarried to Kevin Newkirchen. In 2005, Meyer was charged with two counts of threatening a Wood County judge. In 2006, a jury found him guilty of the allegations. Meyer was charged with 10 counts of stalking after contacting jury members who had convicted him and another jury convicted him on six counts. Years were passing by and the police were still without answers, but soon the case was about to take a turn. While Meyer was in Wood County Jail and the Wisconsin prison system awaiting trial on he contacted the Wisconsin Rapids Police Department in 2012 and stated that he wanted to discuss Benny Scruggs' murder. Meyer admitted to authorities that he did not commit the crime but was crucial in solving the case. During the interview, Meyer informed the cops that Ivan was attempting to frame him for Benny's murder. He also indicated that he had gone to the Scruggs' house several times and that his fingerprints would be discovered all over the place, making it simpler for her to execute her plan. He also drew an extensive drawing of the caravan and revealed previously undisclosed features about the residence, such as how the bedroom door would not lock and the back door was bolted shut. The suspicions about Ivan rose even more when a witness stepped forward in 2013. After reading about Benny's murder in a newspaper, in the interview, she said that her son dated Yvonne between 1989 and 1990 while she was still married to her new husband. She went on to add that when she questioned Yvonne about dating her son while married to someone else, Yvonne said that she loved both of them. The witness then warned her that she couldn't have it both ways, to which Yvonne responded that she had previously killed one spouse and could do it again if necessary. The son of the witness who dated Ivan was also present in the interview. He stated that he had inquired about the father of her child and what had happened to him during their courtship. Ivan said that he had died because she murdered him. She did, however, add that she was drunk and couldn't recall much of it. In 2013, the investigators interviewed some of Meyer's inmates. They mentioned that Meyer used to love mentioning his ongoing physical relationship with Yvonne when she was married to Benny. According to the inmates, Meyer also discussed the Benny Scruggs case with other convicts while imprisoned. According to one convict, Meyer waited outside in the caravan park and observed Benny and on July 17, 1985. According to the detainee, Meyer told him that he knew Yvonne Scruggs would be in her son's room at the mobile home, leaving Benny alone in the bedroom. During another interview, a convict informed police that he was told by Meyer about what had happened on the day of Benny Scruggs' murder. According to his statement, Meyer he then went home, undressed, took a shower, and tossed his clothing and the murder weapon in the garbage. Meyer claimed he chose that day to kill because he knew the trash would be picked up first thing in the morning. He also mentioned that the trash collectors scooped up the garbage with the knife in it while the police were still searching for the murder weapon. Yvonne passed away in the city of Eagle River in Wisconsin due to severe alcohol poisoning. Despite the fact that Yvonne was the focus of Benny's investigations and the investigators had reservations about her, she was never accused of or prosecuted for murder. On hearing the news of Yvonne's death, Meyer told a witness that police would never find the knife because she was dead. Another inmate reported to the police that Meyer said he engaged in a physical relationship with Yvonne the night before he killed her husband Benny. Later in 2017, one of Meyer's fellow inmates stated in an interview that Meyer had confessed to killing Benny. He said that Meyer killed Benny because Yvonne refused to be with him while her husband was alive. He continued his interview by saying that he also overheard Meyer on the phone with his mother. In that phone call, Meyer was expressing his relief that both Benny and Yvonne were dead. The tape of the phone call was eventually recovered by the investigators who confirmed the testimony by the witnesses. The Division of Criminal Investigation of the Wisconsin Department of Justice assisted the Wisconsin Rapids Police Department with the investigation. And in 2022, after 37 years, 60-year-old Donald Meyer was charged with the murder of Benny Scruggs. Assistant Wisconsin Attorney General Robert Kaiser was acting as the special prosecutor in the case. 
Meyer, who was in the Racine Correctional Institute in Sturtevant, was scheduled to make his initial appearance on the murder charge on September 9, 2022. However, he refused to come out of his cell for the hearing and even refused to work with his public defender. In December 2022, Meyer's public defender tried to get him a new date for a public hearing, but the judge was not eager to comply. However, Meyer got a second hearing and pleaded not guilty. His next trial was scheduled for April 2023, which took place through a video conference. The trial ended without a conclusive decision. On May 2, 2023, Donald Meyer appeared in court when Judge Todd Wolf ordered the competency assessment after the defendant made a series of allegations. This included Meyer's desire to terminate the contract with his legal representative and continue the case or to serve as his own attorney. Meyer's attorney, Timothy Hogan, claimed he was ignorant of Meyer's wish to relieve him of his duties. Judge Wolf then ordered a competency hearing. Before proceeding with the lawsuit, the case remained without a firm conclusion and no further court action was immediately scheduled. Nonetheless, it seemed quite obvious that Meyer would go through some time in prison even though his fate was not sealed at the hearings. Although Meyer's future was still up in the air, Benny was gone for good. The case of Benny Scruggs was complicated, and from a distance it seemed that any of them could have been the killer. But we'll have to wait and watch how legal proceedings progress. Only then will we have all of the answers. Do you think Meyer was truly responsible for Benny's death or was it all orchestrated by Yvonne? Share your thoughts in the comments section. Saratoga is a city in Wood County, Wisconsin, located in Silicon Valley in southeastern Bay Area. Saratoga is an affluent residential community known for its wineries, restaurants, and attractions like Villa Montalvo, Mountain Winery, and Haycone Gardens. It not only offers inviting neighborhoods and friendly communities, but also a booming industry and incredible growth opportunities. Saratoga is home to several unique neighborhoods, each with its own character and charm. Brookview and Pride's Crossing in the north, Blue Hills and Greenbrier in the southwest, and Congress Springs in the southwestern corner of Saratoga. But amidst the beauty and charm of such vibrant communities, a sinister crime was committed in 1984. A 73-year-old woman was found brutally murdered in her own home, leaving investigators with little to no substantial evidence. Eleanor Roberts of Nakusa, Wood County, Wisconsin, was born on April 10, 1911. She was a beloved mother, wife, and grandmother. She had a son named Marshall Roberts who lived close to her in Saratoga. Known for her kind-hearted nature and always going out of her way to make sure everyone around her feels loved and cared for, she was a beloved member of the Saratoga community that she was residing in 1984. Sadly, when she was least expecting it, tragedy was waiting for her just around the corner. The events that unfolded in the Roberts household on that fateful day on November 27, 1984, was nothing short of chilling. It was after Eleanor failed to show up to meet her brother at an automobile dealership where she was looking to buy a car that her brother went to her home on South Hollywood, but when Eleanor didn't answer the door, he called her son Marshall Roberts. As Marshall made his way to his mother's Saratoga home, little did he know that he was about to be confronted with a scene of horror that would stay with him for the rest of his life. Marshall knew there was a key to his mother's house kept at a hidden place outdoors. As soon as he unlocked the door and entered the home, he immediately noticed that something was amiss. The air was heavy. The house was eerily quiet. But it wasn't until he made his way to the bathroom that he realized the magnitude of what had happened. As he opened the bathroom door, Marshall was hit with a sight that he could never have prepared for. His mother, Eleanor Roberts, lay motionless on the floor in a pool of her own blood. Her head was covered with a bath mat, which Marshall immediately pulled back, only to be confronted with the unthinkable. His mother's lifeless body, with signs of violent trauma. In that moment, Marshall knew that he was looking at a crime scene, one that would forever change the course of his life. Marshall immediately dialed 911 and reported that he had found his mother dead in her own home and gave the address to the police. Within minutes, officers were dispatched to the location. After he dialed 911, he was taken to the hospital. In a short while, the place was packed with Wood County Sheriff's Department detectives and forensic team personnel. The forensic pathologist who did the autopsy determined that she died from a combination of blunt force trauma and numerous stab wounds, which based on the shape and other factors he believed came from being stabbed with scissors. There were no natural causes related to her death and the death was ruled a homicide, as the sheriff's office report stated. Someone had stabbed and beaten Eleanor to death. She suffered broken ribs and a punctured heart and lungs, the wounds being consistent with being stabbed with a pair of scissors. 
the only items authorities found missing upon further investigation of the home were a pair of scissors, a knife, and a telephone, according to the warrant. As the investigation into the tragic loss of an innocent life unfolded, the killer seemed to have left no trace behind, leaving the authorities with nothing to go on. But just when all hope seemed lost, a glimmer of light appeared in the form of a palm print that was found in the bathroom where Eleanor's body was found. Investigators found the knife that same day on Hillcrest Avenue in Saratoga, not far from Robert South Hollywood Road home. They found the scissors the next day, about a mile and a quarter away, and the telephone four months later in March 1985 in the Wisconsin River, about two and a half miles away. On the day of Eleanor's death, an officer found a ski mask on the branch of a tree across from Eleanor's home, according to the criminal complaint. It appeared to have been thrown there. The mask, along with the knife, the scissors, and the phone were found in places along the same route. The investigators theorized that the potential suspect lived along this route as well. The route on which the evidence was found led the investigators to John A. Sarver, an employee who worked at a store where Eleanor had purchased a lawnmower from. On December 3, 1984, Sarver was first interviewed. He told investigators the day before Eleanor's death he was with another witness shooting pool at Evergreen Lanes. Investigators learned that Eleanor came into contact with Sarver when she bought a lawnmower from Competition Cycle where he worked. During the summer of 1984, the lawnmower required repairs covered by warranty and Sarver had performed the repairs when Eleanor made the complaint. On May 1, 1985, Sarver was interviewed again and he confirmed his last contact with Eleanor would have been in the summer of 1984 when he went to repair the lawnmower she had bought from his employer. When the palm print that was found in the bathroom was identified and confirmed as Sarver's, he was interviewed again. And again he told the investigators that his last contact with her was late summer, early fall 1984, which was consistent with other records investigators had, but Sarver said he never was inside her home. So how did his handprint get there? The other witness Sarver claimed to have been with at the time of the murders was also interviewed and while the witness could not specifically remember everything that night, he said he didn't remember ever shooting pool with Sarver. Investigators said he gave several different alibis in that interview. And upon further interrogation of the witnesses Sarver had claimed to be with, none of them could be confirmed. In fact, another witness he said that he was with told investigators they were by themselves that evening. During various interviews, Sarver gave different explanations of where he was when Eleanor was killed. Investigators were never able to confirm any of his explanations or alibis. Another witness around the time of Eleanor's death told investigators Sarver was having financial difficulties and that he had borrowed $2,000 from him shortly after the murder. The witness said he was never paid back. In 2005, a confidential informant at the time told investigators that 17 years earlier, Sarver admitted to killing a woman with a karate chop to her neck, which matched Eleanor's injuries, according to the complaint. For small claims, cases were filed against Sarver since 2006 for non-payment of bills and one similar case was filed three months after he was arrested. Eventually, though it seemed like all the evidence pointed to Sarver, the case went cold. Retired Wood County Sheriff's Office Lieutenant Robert Lewandowski, who was one of the first investigators on the case, said the case often stalled through the years. Former Sheriff's investigator Jay Schroeder spent hours organizing years' worth of information. There often were disagreements between investigators and prosecutors about whether the case was ready to be reopened. Lewandowski said for decades it sat cold and a solution seemed impossibly far. Nearly three decades after the crime, in May 2013, investigators said they got a search warrant to obtain DNA from John A. Sarver, whom authorities had regarded as a prime suspect in the case since Eleanor's tragic demise. Jerome C. Lippert, a retired business executive who lives in the Pittsville area and studies local history and events, wrote an article that was published in the Wisconsin Rapids Tribune on December 16, 2016, which made a shocking claim. Not all police officers involved in the case deserve praise. What unfolded was a story within the story. During the late 1980s, John Sarver served as a citizen informant for the Wood County Drug Enforcement Unit under the supervision of Detective Brian Illingworth, also known as Big Al in the field. Illingworth, who was later retired as a detective and former Wood County Sheriff, testified during the trial. Despite attempting to present a favorable view of his work with Sarver, evidence presented during the trial suggested that the former sheriff had become too close to his informant. 
For instance, Sarver was not fingerprinted upon starting his work, a standard procedure that was only carried out two years later by another officer. Additionally, Illingworth attended Sarver's wedding, an uncommon practice, and there was a question during the trial about Sarver becoming heavily intoxicated while under Illingworth's supervision, which is clearly against departmental policy. In 1988, during the investigation into Eleanor Roberts' murder, an intriguing meeting took place at a cabin in Adams County where Sarver and Illingworth were purportedly alone before other law enforcement officers arrived to question Sarver. The details of that conversation held during this private interaction, if any, have never been disclosed. Furthermore, Lippert was aware of another crucial piece of information that never came to light during the trial. In the 1990s, a member of the Roberts family approached then-Sheriff Illingworth with a Reader's Digest article that discussed advances in DNA testing, wondering if it could help with the case. Shockingly, the sheriff glanced at the family member and callously retorted, the suspect is a friend of mine, before tossing the magazine back at them. This is an utterly unacceptable response for any law enforcement officer to give to a grieving family member seeking justice for their loved one. It can now be openly stated that not all police officers involved in this case deserve praise. This attitude or conflict could have contributed to the delay in justice for this case. Furthermore, there was a peculiar incident that occurred towards the end of Sheriff Illingworth's career in Wood County, which may have some correlation. It is possible that some long-term residents in the area remember that in 1997, Illingworth was admitted to Rock County Institution, allegedly due to depression and struggles with alcohol and drug abuse. This information was initially kept from the public, but eventually came to light and as a result, Illingworth decided not to seek re-election in 1998. He retired from law enforcement without much fanfare the following year. In that article, Lippert also noted that there had been a chief suspect. At the time, he was not at liberty to name the individual for obvious reasons. But that person was Mr. Sarver. Lippert also indicated that the whole story was not being told. Indeed, the trial proved that his assertion was also correct. He asked for renewed interest in this case, which led the investigators to work on this case determined to find the killer of Eleanor Roberts. The Wood County Sheriff's Officer Heiser added, The first thing we did was look at all the evidence, looked at the 5,000, 6,000 pages of reports that were done over the years. And then we met with all the investigators who had worked the case. The accused, Sarver, was 21 when Eleanor died, worked at a business that sold her a lawnmower, and had gone to service it at her home, according to the warrant. At first he told authorities he was never inside Robert's home, but investigators later found his palm print on the bathroom counter. In April 2020, the same witness told investigators that Sarver admitted to going into Eleanor's home to rob her. He said he was surprised she was home and beat her to death by accident, according to the complaint. After nearly 36 years, developments were made in the gruesome central Wisconsin murder case. One of the key witnesses who wanted to remain anonymous finally came forward in 2020 after almost four decades of suppressing his memories, primarily due to fear. He was the one who confirmed at trial that there were in fact three people at the crime scene in 1984. During his testimony, Mr. Sarver was referred to as a scary dude due to his connections with the police, which made him afraid to speak out and even fear for his safety. In 2020, he overcame his fear of John Sarver and decided to come forward with his painful memories, realizing that it was better to confront them before he died. His testimony was truly gripping. The courtroom was so silent that one could have heard a pin drop. As per the complaint, the witness told the investigators that he had heard that Sarver had confessed to breaking into Eleanor's house through the rear entrance with the intention of robbing her and accidentally killing her. The criminal complaint states that the department persisted in submitting samples for DNA testing from 1988 until 2020, utilizing increasingly sophisticated testing techniques as they became available. The case experienced a setback after charges were pressed in 2020. The Wood County Sheriff's Office and Wisconsin Department of Justice, DOJ, announced that on August 27, 2020, the prime suspect of this case, John A. Sarver from Port Edwards, Wisconsin, had been arrested in connection to the first-degree murder in the death of 73-year-old Eleanor Roberts. If convicted, Sarver, who had been in jail pending a $1 million cash bond, had been charged faces a maximum sentence of life in prison. Sarver had a hearing and requested would County Circuit Judge Nicholas Brazett Jr. delay the trial schedule to start March 14, 2022. 
Robert Sun, an assistant Wisconsin Attorney General Annie J., a special prosecutor in the case, both asked Brazett to keep the trial scheduled for March 14th through 18th, according to online court records. Sarver's attorney, Jeremy Meyer O'Day, said he and attorney Taylor Hart needed more time to interview witnesses and finish their investigation. Brazett ordered the trial be reset and scheduled for a hearing for updates on March 15, 2022. And in November 2022, John Sarver was found guilty at trial of killing Eleanor Roberts. Because Sarver committed the crime after November 3, 1983, but before August 31, 1995, the court the judge has no say over his parole eligibility. Sarver will have to serve 13 years and four months before he can go before a parole board. An inmate must satisfy five requirements before the parole commissioner may recommend a grant to the parole chair. The five requirements are good conduct, competition of programming, sufficient reduction in risk to the public upon release, sufficient time served so as not to depreciate the seriousness of the offense, and a completed and approved release plan as determined by request of an investigation by the commission. He has had the opportunity to live a full life, to raise a family that maybe he shouldn't have had the opportunity to do. It's a good thing that he did it because there are good people in this world, but there isn't any, nothing in my mind or heart that makes me think that he should have opportunities to get out there, said Judge Brazil, was his parole, according to the reports. The arrest came as the result of a joint investigation between the Sheriff's Department and the State Department of Justice which will prosecute the case, Wood County Sheriff's Sean Becker said. It was a brutal homicide that has gone unsolved for way too long, Becker said during a news conference outside the Wood County Courthouse. There were times that people were frustrated, but we never gave up. The prosecutors from the state of Wisconsin Department of Justice, DOJ, did an excellent job of methodically building their case. The lead defense attorney did his job in fine fashion as well, working to cast doubt whenever he could. Ultimately, however, he was not successful because from my perspective, the facts were just too much to overcome, Wood County Sheriff Sean Becker said. November 2, 2022, in Branch 2, Wood County Court, a guilty verdict was finally rendered in the case. John A. Sarver was convicted of this heinous crime and the case finally came to its conclusion. On January 23, 2023, justice was finally served in the case when John A. Sarver was sentenced for the first-degree murder of 73-year-old Eleanor Roberts. The resolution is a significant achievement and testament to law enforcement officials' dedication and persistence providing closure to the victim's family and the community, and reminding us that justice can be served regardless of time past. This case takes us to Sanford, one of the cities of the U.S. state of Florida. It is situated in the central part of Florida. Sanford, the historic waterfront gateway city, is located near the mouth of the St. John's River on the southern edge of Lake Monroe. Thousands of years before the city was founded, Native Americans inhabited the region. Since then, a myriad of diverse people settled down in the Sanford region. The historic district has grown in recent years, drawing a wide range of restaurants and breweries and providing a charming low-key nightlife to the city. The Army, Air Force, and Naval Training Center in Orlando brought plenty of people to reside in Sanford for comfort. It has a tight-knit community where people help one another, even though it has its share of local crime. Pamela Kahanas's murder was one such crime. At Stanford witnessed in 1984. Born on August 24, 1958, in Stillwater, Washington County, Minnesota, Pamela Jane Kahanis was the second youngest of eight siblings. Her parents, Louis and Alice Kahanis, ran a dairy farm together to raise their eight children. Pamela was raised in a close-knit, loving family in Stillwater. Later, she relocated to St. Paul so she could work for a publishing house. By the time she was 25, she wanted to explore more. She applied for the Navy and fortunately she got the offer from the Navy to travel the globe. Pamela gladly accepted the offer and decided to report to boot camp in Orlando with her parents' approval. It was because of her background on the family farm. She was confident and well-prepared for military duty. In order to travel across the nation to Florida, Pamela Cajonis bid farewell to her seven brothers and sisters in May 1984. She was excited about the boot camp and was indeed thriving in her training. Finally, she successfully made it through two months and graduated from the Naval Training Center of Orlando. Before reporting for her duty to serve the nation, she wanted to return home one more time to spend time with her loving family in Minnesota. But things didn't go as planned. 
On August 3, 1984, Pamela graduated from her training in the Orlando Naval Training Center after two months of hard work and consistency. The next morning, Pamela went to the Fashion Square Mall in Orlando. She bought a few things and spent a good time strolling around the area. She bought something in the late afternoon at a Kmart in Orlando. Between 6 p.m. and 7.30 p.m., she was spotted at the Navy Training Center with an unidentified man and then in Main Street. The two were strolling in the same area. Pamela and the unknown man were later spotted at the Mariners Club, a pub and club on the she was supposedly also seen after 8 p.m. at an ABC liquor store in Sanford. She was quite excited about the new life she was stepping into. However, fate had other plans for her. On the morning of August 5, 1984, a car was passing by the Riverview area near Sanford. It was around 7 a.m. and the driver was enjoying the calmness around when his eyes landed on something unusual. It was a woman lying unconscious in the front yard of an abandoned house in the same area. The driver stopped his car and took a closer look at the woman. It didn't take him long to understand that what he thought to be an unconscious woman laying on a lawn was actually deceased. He immediately called 911 and reported everything that he had discovered. Seminole County Police rushed to the crime scene. The police confirmed that it was the body of 25-year-old Pamela Cajuns. She was found almost naked except for a pair of white underwear. Nobody knew how she got to be a half hour north of the Orlando Naval Training Facility. Was she taken to that place or did she go there willingly? Based on the immediate physical evidence on her body, police reported that she had been beaten and strangled. They were also able to deduce that she was not killed at the location where her body was found, rather she was just dumped there from a vehicle with all of her belongings. A generic receipt found at the crime site indicated that a transaction was made by Pamela at a Chinese restaurant around 1 a.m., which confirmed that she was still alive at 1 a.m. on August 5, 1984. Pamela had her whole life in front of her. But there she was, lying dead cold in the front yard of an abandoned house. A young lady who dreamt of serving the nation by fighting for it lost the battle of life to some vicious criminal. Was the criminal someone she already knew? Or was it some stranger who resided in the local area? What could be the motive behind this murder? The investigation started immediately after finding her body and the detectives firmly believed that the suspect was related to the training base. They found bloodstains on her fingernails and it was reported in the autopsy that she tried fighting back for 8 to 10 minutes, but then the murderer overpowered her and was successful in killing her. In fact, the police also retrieved bodily fluid samples from her underwear which police believed to be a significant piece of evidence in the case. Other than that, police were able to get a detailed timeline of her movements and places where she had been seen between August 3, 1984, the day of graduation, and August 5, 1984, the day her body was found, in case any clues could lead the investigators to the suspect. It helped investigators with two things. First, it arranged the series of events that took place before her murder in chronological order. And second, it provided them with a suspect who Pamela was hanging out with when she was last seen at Mariner's Club on the night of August 4, 1984. Investigators were unable to identify her close friends because the majority of Pamela's classmates had already departed Orlando. Could not understand why somebody would want to harm her. Detectives of Seminole County, Florida, put a lot of effort into the case, but no arrests were ever made. Slowly and unfortunately due to the lack of evidence, the case went cold. However, in the late 1980s, in a demoralizing turn of events, the family received a tip that the suspect might have been captured, but it was revealed that the tip was inaccurate. One of Pamela's older siblings, Eileen Cajuns Bergman, recalled that the incident led her and her family to lose faith in the investigation. Justice seemed like a dream for the Cajuns family at that time. Investigators were as frustrated as the family, if not more. They had similar questions in their minds. How long would it take to capture the perpetrator? If the killer is still roaming around freely, how many more lives, like Pamela's, are at stake? The case was reopened in 1995 when the investigators were confident that they had access to new and better technology. They carried out forensic tests on Pamela's underwear from a new perspective. With the DNA taken from under her fingernails and the bodily fluid that was found on the forensic experts were able to create a DNA profile of the suspect. Although they did succeed in creating the DNA profile of the suspect, they did not manage to identify him. Without any constructive lead to move on, detectives were standing at the same point they started the investigation. Slowly, the case turned cold again for almost another two decades. The Cajonis family tried to move on, but couldn't. 
As Pamela's death and not finding the person behind it weighed way more than they thought. It wasn't until 2018 that investigators had the technology that had the potential to provide a more constructive result. Thus, they decided to give this case another shot and try their luck again. Based on the extracted DNA and the suspect profiling performed in the 1990s, they were able to build a family tree after uploading the data of the extracted DNA to a public database and analyzing the matches. This led them to 59-year-old Thomas Lewis Garner, who was a dental hygienist practicing in Jacksonville in 2018. Born on January 16, 1960, Thomas Lewis Garner grew up in Glenwood, Alabama, USA. In his long career, he had the phase of serving the nation when he joined the military and training centers of the Naval Recruitment Facilities. In 1984, he was training at Orlando Naval Training Center. Soon after, he decided to leave the military and practiced as an independent dental hygienist. In February 2019, a surveillance team watching Gardner observed him throwing out a bag of garbage at his Jacksonville residence. They retrieved a cigarette butt, a cotton swab, and a piece of used dental floss from the bag. These items were sent for DNA analysis. Soon after, the results were back. DNA from the bodily fluid on Pamela's underwear matched Garner's DNA. The Seminole County Sheriff's Department detective texted the Cajonis family on Sunday, March 10, 2019, to set up a face-to-face -face meeting in Minnesota, where five of the siblings still resided. The family was expecting an informal meeting that would include some case updates, as the detectives had not explained the reasons before the meeting. The siblings gathered at Bugman's home, and four days later on March 14, 2019, Thursday morning, it was the time for the meeting. When the investigators entered the room and announced that she wanted to show them a video, the siblings were sure it was some update on the case of their deceased sister. The footage showed Thomas being taken into custody on March 13, 2019, one day before the meeting. Thomas Gardner was unknown to the Catton's family. However, his existence now was a constant reminder to them that he was the one who took away the life of their loving sister, Pam. Eileen recalled the moment investigators informed them about the arrest. She remarked that the siblings never really knew that the case would be solved, so once they were informed about the arrest, they were overjoyed and overwhelmed with a sense of relief. It was after the Cajonis family was informed the news of the arrest was made public, remarked that the man probably thought he was getting away with murder. Investigators were now able to retrieve information about his background, which suggested that Thomas was stationed at the Naval Training Facility in Orlando at the same time as Pamela Cajonis. After his arrest, he denied knowing Pamela in person and remarked that he did not understand how he was charged with her murder. Thomas additionally turned up as a potential DNA match in a Honolulu homicide from September 1982. An Atlanta-based employee of Delta Airlines named Kathy Hicks vanished while traveling to Hawaii. Thomas's DNA, according to authorities, matched evidence found at the spot where Kathy Hicks' body was found on a grassy slope along now a new poly drive close to a ravine. According to reports, Kathy was beaten to death and strangled, just like Pamela. The detectives even found out that he was in Honolulu when Kathy was visiting a softball tournament with her Delta Airlines co-workers and later turned up dead. Thomas Lewis Garner was not charged with killing Kathy Hicks because the case's evidence had not yet been thoroughly examined. He was taken up for his trial at the Seminole County Courthouse in as the four-day trial commenced, Pamela's family assembled to seek justice for their beloved Pam. During the trial, Anna Valentini, assistant state attorney, said in a statement that for the sake of defending her nation, Pamela Cajuns joined the Navy. Instead, she was forced to defend herself against Thomas Garner for more than eight minutes before succumbing to his attacks. Thomas maintained his innocence throughout his trial, admitting that he was pretty promiscuous at the time, but denying that he killed her. He also stated that if he had a casual fling with Pamela, he probably wouldn't remember. Although the motive behind the murder was unknown and Thomas kept on pleading not guilty to the charges against him, the matching DNA of his bodily fluid found in the underwear of Pamela and the DNA profile of Thomas told a different story. The fact that they were in the same naval training facility in Orlando in the same period was significant enough for the 12-member jury of the Seminole County Courthouse to give away the verdict of this case. The charges against him were proved in favor of the prosecution. After two hours of review at the Seminole County Courthouse in Sanford, Thomas Garner of Jacksonville was found guilty by a jury, according to Todd Brown, a spokesperson for the Seminole Brevard State Attorney Phil Archer. Circuit Judge Marlene Alva gave Thomas Garner a life sentence in prison. 
Two hours after the procedure with the jury began on the Pamela Kahani's murder case, Eileen said the moment the decision was read was bittersweet. She knew that her young sister Pamela wouldn't ever return, but they still had to seek justice and let Pamela's soul rest in peace. She acknowledged the loss that was around the joy after the verdict was made against Thomas Garner. There was some relaxation, but there was no sense of closure. It'll stay up there for a while, Eileen said. Our parents are no longer with us, so it would have been lovely to be able to share it with them and let them appreciate this moment. However, the siblings acknowledged the happiness that the news brought for the rest of them. Nevertheless, the family had some painful recollections after hearing the judgment. Jerry Kahanes, Pamela's elder brother, stated it brought them right back to that same day when they heard the bad news. In Lake Elmo, near Highway 36, a striking new billboard appeared at Eileen's family's company. Country Sun Farm and Greenhouse after the arrest. It was erected by Eileen's son, who was only 11 years old when his aunt tragically passed away. The billboard was put up to ensure that the entire community could bear witness to justice. Over the years, the case remained a point of deep interest for neighbors, friends, and Pamela's former classmates from Stillwater High who have steadfastly maintained their involvement. Federal Way, Washington is a city that perfectly blends urban amenities with natural beauty. With its stunning views of Mount Rainier and the shimmering Puget Sound, it's a paradise for nature lovers. The city has a population of over 100,000 people, making it a bustling and diverse community. From shopping malls to movie theaters to sports centers, Federal Way has everything you need for a modern lifestyle. Despite its urban flair, the city has a warm and welcoming vibe that's hard to resist. However, in 1991, a tragic incident rocked the city to its core. The brutal murder of Sarah Yarbrough sent shockwaves through the community, turning this idyllic place into a scene of horror. Sarah Yarbrough was born on October 3, 1975 in the city of Federal Way, Washington. She was a young woman full of life and energy. Sarah had an infectious smile that could light up a room and a kind heart that touched everyone she met. Sarah was an excellent student who excelled academically, but her true passion lay in the arts. And music was her life. She exhibited her love for dance and music by joining the school's cheerleading team. She loved to sketch, paint, and create works of art that could express her innermost feelings. Sarah was a caring sister to her younger brother Andrew and always made time for him even when she was busy with her own interests. She was the kind of person who would go out of her way to help someone in need. Her friends described her as a beautiful person inside and out and her teachers adored her for her hardworking attitude and dedication to her studies. The day of the murder, in the cold morning of December 14, 1991, Sarah Yarborough woke up with excitement bubbling inside her. It was the day of the drill competition and she had been looking forward to this day for weeks. She got dressed in her cheerleading outfit, put on some music and started doing her hair. After getting ready, she got into her car and drove to Federal Way High School. As she pulled into the parking lot, she saw her teammates gathered around the bus, chatting and laughing. She parked her car and walked over to join them feeling happy and excited. However, things took a dark turn soon after. On December 14, 1991, Sarah did not make it onto the school bus scheduled to leave Federal Way High School at 9.30 a.m. Her body was discovered by two boys who were cutting through the campus and saw a man pop out of the bushes and quickly walk away, tossing glances over his shoulder at them. As they passed by, they saw Sarah's body lying in a brushy area near the school's tennis courts, just 150 feet away from where her parked car was located. The boys ran back to one boy's house to alert his parents. One boy's father drove to the school and immediately called 911, leading to a large-scale police response. The police quickly realized that they were dealing with a horrific crime and immediately began gathering evidence from the crime scene. Detective Jim Doyen, the lead investigator in her murder case, felt a deep sense of responsibility to find justice for her. He led the investigation and the King County Sheriff's Department took charge of the case. The police recovered DNA from the scene, including semen stains on Sarah's clothing and DNA from underneath her fingernails. However, the DNA did not match anyone in their database. Despite hundreds of individuals being swabbed, the case remained unsolved for many years. The police also examined Sarah's cell phone and vehicle but found no significant information. Jody Sass, a DNA scientist at the Washington State Patrol Crime Lab, worked tirelessly on the case, along with other investigators and scientists. 
the case had all the solvability factors that investigators could ask for, including a single-source male DNA profile and two eyewitnesses who provided a sketch and a detailed description of the suspect they had seen leaving the crime scene. The King County Sheriff's Department immediately started a search for the suspect and circulated two composite sketches of a possible suspect in the local media, hoping that someone would recognize him. The sketches depicted a man in his 20s at the time of the attack with shoulder-length blonde hair. He was described as wearing a black trench coat and driving a 1970 tan Chevrolet Nova style car. The police also shared details of the man's physical appearance and other information they had gathered from the scene. Despite the police's best efforts, the sketches did not lead to the identification of a suspect and a name was never put to the sketch. The lack of a suspect meant that the case remained unsolved for many years, causing anguish to Sarah's family and friends. The case continued to receive media coverage and the police continued to appeal for information. But no new leads emerged. The case went cold for 30 years. As Sarah's younger brother Andrew ran around the field kicking the ball with his teammates, he had no idea that his world was about to shatter into a million pieces. His mind was consumed with the game, unaware that just a few miles away, his sister was taking her last breaths. As the game progressed, the police arrived at the field. Andrew's parents were pulled aside and given the news that would change their lives forever. Meanwhile, Andrew continued to play, completely unaware of the tragedy that had befallen his family. It was only later when he returned home that the full extent of the situation became clear. Sarah's absence felt like a gaping hole in the heart of the family. Andrew was left to grumble with the knowledge that his beloved sister was gone forever, taken from him by an unknown assailant in a senseless act of violence. After the case had lain cold for 30 years, the investigation started again upon finding a new twist. The connection between the Yarborough case and the Mayflower Fullers is a fascinating one and it highlights the power of genetic genealogy in solving cold cases. The Fuller YSD or Surname Project was a group of descendants of Robert Fuller who arrived in Salem, Massachusetts in the 1630s and were relatives of the Mayflower Fullers. The project consisted of individuals who share the Fuller surname and had undergone YSDR testing, which analyzes short tandem repeats on the Y chromosome that are passed down from father to son. When identifiers began working on the Yarborough case in 2011, they searched the YSDR database and found a match between the killer's YSDR profile and members of the Fuller project. This led investigators to William Fuller, a longtime friend of the Yarborough family, who had been in the area at the time of the murder. Fuller's daughter Elizabeth was also a classmate of Sarah's. William Fuller voluntarily gave a DNA sample, which was compared to the crime scene DNA. It was determined that he was not the killer, nor was he the father of the killer. However, his YSDR profile matched the Y profile from the crime scene DNA, indicating he was a paternal cousin of the killer. This was an important breakthrough in the case because it allowed authorities to trace the killer's genealogy back to the 1600s, even though the killer himself was still unknown. Investigators looked into other fullers in the area, but the case went cold again. It wasn't until 2019 that the case saw a breakthrough. When DNA evidence found at the scene was matched to a profile in the National Combined DNA Index System, or CODES, database. This match identified Patrick Leon Nicholas as a potential suspect in the case. CODES is a large computer database that enables federal, state, and local forensic laboratories to exchange and compare DNA profiles electronically, linking violent crimes to each other and to known offenders. The DNA match was achieved using autosomal SNP testing, which analyzes single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs throughout an individual's genome to identify potential relatives. Patrick Neon Nicholas, the suspect in the 1991 murder of Sarah Yarbrough, was a man with a dark past. Born in the early 1960s, Nicholas was in his late 20s at the time of the murder. He was described as having a lean, athletic build, standing at around six feet tall, with short brown hair and brown eyes. Nicholas had a troubled history long before he became a suspect in the Yarborough case. In 1986, he was arrested for possession of cocaine and received a sentence of 30 days in jail. He was arrested again in 1988, this time for the assault of a young girl in Benton County, Oregon. Nicholas approached the victim in her car, brandishing a knife and threatening to kill her. He then forced her to undress and walked her towards a river where she managed to escape by swimming away. He was convicted of the crime and sentenced to 10 years in prison, though he was released after serving only four years. 
Despite his criminal history, Nicholas was never a suspect in the Yarborough case until advances in forensic genetic genealogy brought his DNA to the attention of detectives. Patrick Neon Nicholas was a man who had managed to escape suspicion for all those years. Despite a rap sheet that included arrests for assault and other crimes, Nicholas had never been on the radar of the investigators who had tirelessly worked the case. But DNA doesn't lie, and when forensic scientists examined the genetic material found at the crime scene and compared it to a sample from Nicholas, they found a match that was nothing short of remarkable. Perfect match. The odds of someone else having the same genetic profile was 1 in 120 quadrillion. It was a revelation that stunned everyone involved in the case. To build their case against Nicholas, detectives put him under surveillance following his every move. And it was during this surveillance that they were able to collect the evidence they needed. And a paper napkin that fell from Nicholas's pocket were all it took. The DNA on one of the cigarettes was a match for the DNA found on several items of Yarbrough's clothing at the scene. It was a long time coming, but finally there was a break in the case. And it was all thanks to the groundbreaking technology of forensic genetic genealogy. Nicholas was finally arrested in January 2019 and his trial began in January 2020, nearly 30 years after the murder of Sarah Yarborough. The trial of Patrick Leon Nicholas for the murder of Sarah Yarborough was a tense and emotional affair. Throughout the proceedings, the prosecution presented a compelling case against Nicholas, linking him to the crime through strong forensic evidence. Expert witnesses testified that DNA samples taken from Yarborough's clothing and body matched Nicholas's DNA, which had been collected from cigarette butts and a napkin left behind by Nicholas while he was under surveillance. This evidence proved to be crucial in the case against Nicholas. Furthermore, prosecutors argued that Nicholas had assaulted Yarborough before strangling her to death. They also presented testimony from witnesses who claimed to have seen Nicholas near the school on the day of the murder. This testimony, combined with the DNA evidence, made a strong case against Nicholas. In response, Nicholas's defense team tried to cast doubt on the prosecution's evidence, especially the reliability of DNA testing. They also argued that there were other potential suspects. Who should have been investigated more thoroughly, but who were overlooked by investigators? However, the prosecution was able to refute those claims and maintain their case against Nicholas. During the trial, Yarborough's mother Laura emotionally testified about the moment when she learned that her daughter's body had been found. Her mother's testimony brought back painful memories for those in the courtroom, including friends from the Federal Way High School class of 1993 who packed the room. One of Sarah's friends, Shannon Grant, testified about driving by the school and seeing police caution tape after the murder. The trial was also a reminder of the passage of time as many of the original detectives on the case had retired or passed away and some witnesses had moved away. One of the officers who initially responded to the scene in 1991 also testified during the trial highlighting the longevity and complexity of the case. The trial was a highly emotional affair for Yarborough's family and friends. They were present throughout the proceedings, listening to testimony about the brutal murder of their loved emotions ran high as they waited for justice to be served after more than three decades of waiting. The trial lasted several weeks, during which time the jury heard from dozens of witnesses and experts. The proceedings were meticulous and thorough, with each piece of evidence and testimony carefully examined. In the end, the jury found Patrick Neon Nicholas guilty of first-degree murder, and he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The verdict brought closure to Yarborough's family and friends, who had waited more than three decades for justice to be served. While the trial was a difficult and emotional experience, they were finally able to see the person responsible for their loved one's death brought to justice. The trial served as a reminder that justice may be delayed, but it will eventually be served. The comments made by the mother and friends of Sarah Yarborough are a testament to the lasting impact of her murder on their lives. For Laura Yarborough, the case had been a constant weight on her and her family's minds. The news of the arrest was both a relief and a trigger, bringing back all the emotions of 1991. The thought of what Sarah could have accomplished in her life also added to their sorrow. Despite their grief, they were united in their determination to see justice served for their loved one. Laura Yarbrough said that although they continued with their lives, the case was always at the back of their minds as unfinished business. She expressed that living with this for 28 years had been exhausting and if the case had never been solved, it would have cast a shadow over their lives for the rest of their time.
Nestled on the southwestern side of Dallas, Texas, lies a neighborhood with a unique charm and character, Oak Cliff. This vibrant community boasts a fusion of eclectic cultures, diverse architecture, and natural beauty that exudes an undeniable charm. As you enter Oak Cliff, you are greeted by a kaleidoscope of colors that adorn the streets and buildings, from the stunning murals that line the walls to the quirky boutiques and vibrant markets, there is no shortage of eye-catching sights to behold. Oak Cliff is a place where people know their neighbors and take pride in their community. Its population of over 64,000 is made up of a diverse group of individuals, each with their own unique story to tell. From artists to entrepreneurs, the neighborhood is home to people from all walks of life. But it was here, in this seemingly peaceful neighborhood, that a horrible crime took place in 1989. Mary Haig Kelly was a woman who lived a long and fulfilling life at her residence in North Francis Street in Oak Cliff, Dallas. She was born in Clarksville, Texas on May 5, 1911, to her parents, John and Lulu May Haig, John Jr. and Richard, and a sister, Maddie. From a young age, Mary had a passion for learning, which she would carry with her throughout her life. Mary attended East Texas State Teachers College, which is now known as Texas A&M University Commerce. In 1931, she graduated with a degree in education and went on to teach at several schools. Mary's teaching career spanned over 30 years in the Dallas Independent School District, where she was loved by her students for her kindness and compassion. Mary never married and had no children of her own. She lived alone in an apartment at Villa de Oro Complex in Oak Cliff, a neighborhood in Dallas. Mary was known for being a private person who kept to herself, but she was friendly with her neighbors and would often stop to chat with them. By 1989, Mary was 78 years old. She had been retired for several years but still kept in touch with many of her former students. She was a beloved member of the community and had a reputation for being a kind and caring person. But little did anyone know that a tragic event was waiting for her just around the corner. On the chilly winter day of January 19, 1989, the Dallas Police Department received a distressing call. A concerned relative of Mary Haig Kelly had used his own key to enter her residence after being unable to get in touch with her. Upon entering, he was met with a horrifying sight. Mary Haig Kelly was found dead, naked from the waist down, shoved underneath her. The relative immediately called the police and patrol officers rushed to the scene. As the officers arrived on the scene, they were met with a tense atmosphere. The home was quiet, yet the sense of unease was palpable. The relative who had discovered Mary's body was waiting outside, his face etched with worry and grief. The officers entered the residence, apprehensive about what they might find. The officers' eyes were immediately drawn to the bed where they saw Mary Haig Kelly's lifeless body shoved underneath the bed. She lay there naked from the waist down, as if someone had been there with her and taken advantage of her vulnerable state. The sight of her limp, cold body was an image that would stay with the officers for a long time to come. Everyone who knew her, from her former students to her neighbors, was devastated by her untimely and violent death. Mary was known for her gentle and caring personality and the idea that someone could do something so heinous to her was almost unbearable. The post-mortem examination revealed that Mary had been strangled to death, her life for her humanity. Some items missing from her home indicated that a burglary had taken place, but the absence of forced entry was puzzling. How had the perpetrator gotten into Mary's home undetected? The investigation into Mary Haig Kelly's murder was intensive and thorough, with detectives interviewing several persons of interest and canvassing local pawn shops for her stolen valuables. Despite their best efforts, no leads materialized and the investigation began to stall. The lack of forced entry at the crime scene puzzled investigators who could not determine how the perpetrator had gained access to Mary's home without leaving any sign of a break-in. Prints found at the crime scene were submitted for comparison but no matches were found, leaving detectives at a dead end. Forensic DNA evidence was also found, however, there was no one it could be traced to. Frustrated and running out of options, the case information was submitted to the FBI's Violent Crime Apprehension Program, VICAP, in hopes of finding similar cases. Pawn shops throughout the city were contacted to check for stolen items missing from Mary's home, but to no avail. The investigation went on for months, but with no witnesses to the crime and all leads exhausted, the case eventually went cold. Despite the lack of progress, detectives remained committed to solving the case and bringing justice to Mary Haig Kelly and her family. After 33 years, the case of Mary Haig Kelly was reopened in November of 2021 when the Dallas County District Attorney's Office teamed up with Othram to explore if advanced DNA testing could provide new leads. 
The forensic DNA evidence found at the crime scene all those years ago was sent to Othram, and using forensic-grade genome sequencing, they were able to develop a genealogical profile from DNA evidence. With the help of the in-house genealogy team, they were able to produce investigative leads that were submitted back to the Dallas County District Attorney's Office. The investigation continued and in July 2022, 53-year-old Davis Rojas was identified as the suspect in the murder of Mary Hay Kelly, thanks to the breakthrough that Othram provided. The Dallas Police Department arrested Rojas and charged him with capital murder. The funding for the DNA testing and genealogical research was made possible through a grant from Season of Justice. The grant was awarded to Leighton DeAntony from the Dallas County District Attorney's Office. The Season of Justice has been a valuable resource in pushing cold cases forward. Through funding for advanced DNA solutions like forensic genealogy and next-generation sequencing, Rojas was 20 years old at the time of the murder and genetic genealogy led to the half-brother of the man whose DNA was found on Kelly's body. He lived next door to Kelly at the time of her death. The police tracked down the half-brother and used a discarded six-pack of Bud Light to, to that which was found on Kelly's body. The Dallas Police Department announced Rojas' arrest on July 22, 2022, and he is being held at the Dallas County Jail on a $750,000 bond. DeAntony, Assistant District Attorney of Dallas County DA's office, praised the work of Othram in solving this difficult case, saying that the case would not have been solved without them. This case is a testament to the power of advanced DNA testing and genealogical research in solving cold cases that seemed unsolvable for years. The Mary Haig Kelly cold case is a haunting reminder of the importance of justice and closure for victims and their families. For over three decades, the investigation remained cold until advanced DNA testing and genealogical and identified a suspect. The work of organizations like Othram and Season of Justice, along with the relentless dedication of law enforcement officials, played a crucial role in bringing David Rojas to justice. This case serves as a testament to the power of collaboration and cutting-edge technology in the pursuit of justice. While the outcome cannot undo the tragic loss of Mary Hay Kelly, it is a step towards healing and a reminder that no case is truly closed until justice is served. Nestled in the heart of the Lone Star State, Beaumont, Texas, this vibrant city with its own unique character sits along the banks of the mighty Neches River. Home to a diverse population, Beaumont pulsates with energy and intrigue. With a population of over 118,000 residents, Beaumont strikes a balance between a close-knit community and the buzz of urban life. Its streets weave a tapestry of history as evidenced by the stately architecture that adorns its neighborhoods. The city's roots run deep with a rich cultural heritage that resonates in its art, music, and culinary offerings. But this city was also the stage for the chilling tale of Mary Edwards. Mary Catherine Edwards, a name that echoed through the corridors of Price Elementary, was more than just a school teacher. Born on July 9, 1963, to Mary and Edwards and Lum Caswell Edwards, her journey began in a different time in a world that awaited her with open arms. From a young age, Mary exuded a natural intellect and a passion for leading her down the path of education. In 1992, Mary became a teacher at Price Elementary School in Beaumont, Texas. She had a positive presence and engaged her students with her enthusiasm. Throughout her career, she made a lasting impact on her students, encouraging them to embrace learning. Mary's personal story unfolded against the backdrop of Beaumont's close-knit community. Despite her independent spirit, she cherished the bonds of family and friendship. Living alone in her new townhouse on Park Meadow Street, Mary embraced the solitude and freedom it offered. She had a large circle of friends who would often gather at her house and engage in playful banter. The second week of January 1995 had unfolded like any other for Mary Catherine Edwards, seemingly ordinary and uneventful. The days followed a familiar rhythm, each one blending seamlessly into the next. She carried out her responsibilities, nurturing the minds of young students, and returned to the solace of her home on that ill-fated Friday, January 13, 1995. As the evening settled upon Beaumont, Mary embarked on her customary routine. She walked her beloved dog and after a while returned to her townhouse. With a glass of wine in hand, she exchanged sweet words with her devoted boyfriend over a phone call. Little did they know that their tender exchange would mark the final known contact with Mary the next day Mary's parents tried to reach out to their daughter, but they received no response. With each unanswered call, their concern and anxiety deepened. 
Unable to bear the uncertainty any longer, they decided to go to Mary's home, unaware of the horrifying discovery that awaited them. Nervously, they entered her home, their hearts pounding in their chests. What they found in the quietness of the bathroom would forever haunt their memories. Mary Catherine Edwards lay lifeless, drowned in the bathtub before them. Her hands were bound with handcuffs and her life had been cruelly snuffed out. As the reality of the situation sank in, despair tightened its grip on their hearts, but had also been robbed of her very existence. The investigation into Mary Catherine Edwards' case started off with a lot of fervor. The detectives carefully searched the crime scene, looking for any clues that could help solve the mystery. They combed through every inch of her bedroom, collecting and analyzing items with great care. The results of the autopsy were also important in uncovering the truth. The medical examiner examined Mary's body and discovered foreign DNA that pointed the investigators in the right direction. The evidence, including physical items and people's statements, began to form a picture that hinted at who might be responsible for the crime. The investigators worked tirelessly, leaving no stone unturned. They interviewed countless individuals, from people who may have seen something strange to Mary's fellow teachers and people close to her. They wanted to gather as much information as possible to piece together what happened. Despite their hard work, the case eventually hit a dead end. The leads they had once pursued with hope started to fade away, leaving them with a frustrating sense of silence. It was like they were stuck in a dark tunnel, not knowing which way to turn. One detective who had a personal connection to the case through his close friend had vivid dreams relating to Mary's death. In these dreams, he saw the autopsy and imagined Mary reaching out to him as if wanting to reveal the identity of her attacker. But every time, the dream would end abruptly, leaving him with more questions than answers. His determination to find the truth remained strong, and his unique perspective and emotional investment compelled the investigators to seek his guidance. Mary Catherine Edwards' tragic death had a profound impact on everyone touched by her story. It ignited a shared determination to bring closure to her case, reigniting the hope for justice to be served. Despite diligent efforts, the leads in the case gradually dwindled and eventually the investigation reached a standstill. The case went cold, leaving investigators with no substantial breakthroughs or new information to pursue. As the years passed, the memory of Mary Catherine Edwards' tragic case lingered in the hearts of those who knew her and the community that had been touched by her presence. It was a case that held personal significance for many, including Bob Wortham, the district attorney of Jefferson County. Several individuals in the office had personal connections with Mary, either through there or because they attended the same church as her. This sparked a renewed determination to seek justice. The Texas Rangers, led by Brandon Bess, stepped forward to reignite the investigation in 2020. Together with his partners, Aaron and Tina Llewellyn, they embarked on a meticulous journey to re-examine every aspect of the case was to bring all the scattered pieces of evidence together, sorting through the old files and eliminating duplicates, ensuring that nothing was overlooked. With the foundation laid, the team began exploring new possibilities. It was during this time that they crossed paths with Othram Labs, a pioneering force in the field of DNA analysis. Though not an expert in the intricacies of science, recognized the potential that this technology held. He engaged in conversations with experts like Dr. David Middleman, the founder and CEO of Othram Labs, seeking to understand the significance and advantages of DNA analysis in the context of the investigation. Advancements in DNA technology played a crucial role tracking the case. DNA taken from Mary's body was entered into a database and authorities utilized family tree websites to search for potential matches. Finally, in 2020, a breakthrough occurred as a match was found linking the DNA to Clayton Foreman. The long-awaited breakthrough breathed new life. The Christmas of 1977 was a miracle for 15-year-old Marissa as she got the most special gift of her life. She was finally united with her biological sister and her life was taking a huge step forward only to see it all end within three months. On March 28, 1978, after spending a wonderful weekend with her sister, her battered and lifeless body was discovered near Sutro Heights Park in San Francisco. Investigation into the awful tragedy began right away, but the detectives had no idea that it would take more than 40 years to crack the case. What could have happened on Marissa's trip to San Francisco? Who could have subjected a 15-year-old girl to such horror? And today, we'll be solving a cold case of 15-year-old Marissa Harvey who was discovered dead in the city of San Francisco. But before we unravel the case, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Without further ado, let's investigate Marissa Harvey's tragic case. 
With the diversity of scenic splendor, San Francisco really is a place that attracts people from around the world. Nestled between the Golden Gate Bridge and the rolling hills of the Bay Area, the city boasts a diverse landscape that ranges from bustling streets to pristine beaches and scenic parks. The area is a hub of excitement and fast-paced living, with a myriad of opportunities for work, a thriving social scene that never sleeps, and a bustling entrepreneurial culture that keeps the energy high and the innovation flowing. San Francisco, with its allure, contrasts, and enigmatic tales, remains a city where dreams and realities intertwine. It is still considered one of the safest large cities in the country with a relatively low which is a historic public park in the outer Richmond district of western San Francisco. Became the stage for one of the most tragic cold cases in the history of the nation when the battered and bruised body of a 15-year-old girl was discovered in 1978. Marissa Rolf Harvey was born in 1963, someplace in New York. She was an orphan and there was no way of knowing who her biological family members were. Very little was known about her life before being adopted by a family residing in Port Washington, New York when she was three years old. According to Marguerite Schultz, Marissa's adoptive mother, Marissa was a very special, very different little girl. Marissa was a true adventurer at heart and nothing brought her more joy than exploring new horizons on horseback through the rolling hills of her hometown or peddling through the scenic landscapes of Europe during the summers of 76 and 77, Marissa was always seeking her next adventure. Not only did she possess an adventurous spirit, but she also had a compassionate heart. She was known to spend long hours shoveling snow for her elderly neighbors, always ready to lend a helping hand to those in need. Although she began to live a happy life with her new family, deep inside she had a secret desire to learn more about her biological family. Years passed and Marissa soon was 15 years old. Then on that fateful Christmas day of 1977, the tides of fate began to shift. Little did she know that the course of her life was about to take an unexpected turn. The festive spirit was in full swing as Marissa's family celebrated December 25, 1977. A mysterious woman named Miriam Wadif arrived at Marissa's family's home in Port Washington. Miriam made a shocking claim. She was Marissa's long-lost biological sister. She revealed that she had embarked on a relentless quest with the help of a professional research to track down her beloved younger sister. And now, standing before Marissa, Miriam extended an invitation urging her to take a trip to San Francisco to meet her long-lost biological family. Was this a Christmas miracle or an ill-fated incident? Marissa wouldn't miss this opportunity as she was eager to get in touch with her biological family members. The teenager's parents initially hesitated at the thought of letting her go to California by herself, but they eventually agreed. According to her adoptive mother, they didn't really want Marissa to leave, but they felt it would be unfair for her if they didn't let her go. But before allowing it, they had asked Miriam, her sister, to take care of her. Her parents considered that it would be the perfect opportunity for Marissa to embark on a journey. Marissa eagerly awaited her Easter break, counting down the days until her solo trip to San Francisco. Finally, the stage was set and she was ready to go. It was a crisp Friday morning, March 24, 1978, as the plane touched down at San Francisco International Airport. Miriam greeted Marissa with open arms at the airport and brought her to the apartment she was living in. Marissa was more than excited to join her sister for the remainder of the holiday. After spending some of the most amazing days with her sister, it was almost time to return home. But she was not done having fun. On the last day of her trip on March 27th, she requested Miriam to take her horse back riding. At such an innocent request, Miriam couldn't say no to her little sister and had to comply. However, her job was in the way. She was a graduate student and instructor at the San Francisco Institute and had to go back to work. So she requested a friend to take Marissa to the stables on her behalf. Unaware that the stables were closed that day, her sister's friend dropped her off at the Golden Gate Park stables. When Miriam got back home from work, she was shocked to see that Marissa was not home yet. She immediately reported her sister missing. That weekend was supposed to be a special weekend for Marissa and what she deserved was a good ending to the time spent with her sister. Instead, tragedy struck. It was meant to be the last day with her sister in San Francisco, but little did anyone know that it would be the last day of her life. The following evening on March 28, 1978, a young man walking at dusk in the Sutro Heights Park near the Cliff House noticed a pair of tiny feet coming out of a bush and dialed 911. The police reached the place and found Marissa's lifeless body in a bush alongside a pedestrian trail. She was identified by her sister Miriam. 
Seeing Marissa's lifeless body, it was quite obvious to the police that she was a victim of assault. According to the report made by Coroner Boyd Stephan, she had been badly beaten and strangled with a cord-like device after she was violated. The police thoroughly investigated the vicinity to look for clues, but to no avail. The San Francisco Police Department oversaw an investigation that made use of the most advanced technologies at the time and followed every lead. They discovered a DNA sample from the crime scene. However, in the absence of superior technologies during the time, the evidence found failed to help them further progress the investigation. And collect all the evidence that was available, investigators were unable to identify any suspects. With a lack of evidence and no lead to follow on, the case almost immediately got cold. For 42 years, the case stayed dormant until it was reopened by the department's cold case team in October 2020. San Francisco Police Chief Bill Scott expressed his feelings in a statement saying that for more than four decades, Marissa Harvey's family members had been relentless advocates to bring her killer to justice. He firmly felt that the conclusion to the case had been long overdue and their family deserved answers immediately. The police used advanced investigative methods to resume their search for the killer, but they did not elaborate further on the methods. Made up of the SFPD Homicide Unit, the San Francisco District Attorney's Office, the FBI, and the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office in Colorado further investigated the case. According to San Francisco District Attorney Chiza Budin, the case was solved after investigators accessed a third-party DNA database and discovered genetic material from a relative which helped a 76-year-old man named Mark Personette. The hard work by the police and further search in the case paid off and just over one year later on March 15, 2021, his DNA matched with a DNA sample found at the crime scene by the police. So on the same day, SFPD apprehended Personette in suburban Denver. He got arrested by the police 35 miles southwest of his residence in Conifer, Colorado. After the arrest, a joint operation by San Francisco police, the FBI, and the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office was scheduled. Personet was charged with one count of homicide on Thursday, December 16, 2021. In order to determine whether Personet could be connected to any other unsolved killings, San Francisco police stated they were urging all police departments nationwide to search for available records. The departments also made available Personet's old booking images, including many taken by police in New Jersey. When Personet's neighbors were questioned about him during an interview, they said that while they didn't think he would commit such a terrible act, according to online records, for the murder of a little girl and had a hearing set for January 10, 2022, it wasn't immediately clear if he had a lawyer. In the court hearing on January 10, 2022, it was brought to light that Personet was earlier detained for assaults that took place during October and November 1979 in the New Jersey cities of Somerville. Bernard's Township and Hopewell Township. One of these allegations arose from his allegedly luring a 16-year-old girl into his car on the pretense of providing her a ride, taking her to the woods in Basking Ridge, New Jersey, where he assaulted and physically violated her. Despite being attacked, the victim made it to a nearby house where she sought assistance. She was able to give a thorough account of her assailant and the car he was driving. SFGate, a San Francisco Bay Area local news source, claimed that Personet was arrested and charged with aggravated assault in 1980, but he escaped before the case went to trial. After all these years, he was again in for the same situation. However, this time, he could not escape. On Thursday, January 21, 2022, Personet appeared in court in San Francisco for the murder of Marissa Harvey. When the Associated Press left a message for his lawyer Adam Gassner to respond, no reply from his side came through. Later, Gassner stated that Personet had entered a not guilty plea to the charges. According to him, the case was an extremely old case that required a detailed and in-depth defense investigation. In January 2022, he was formally accused of killing 15-year-old Marissa. Although more details about the case were not made public, it was certain that Personet would be held accountable. According to San Francisco District Attorney Chiza Bowden, the police department was making every effort to ensure that Personet would receive severe punishment for the horrific deeds that had claimed Marissa's life. They were determined to offer her family some measure of comfort. It took 44 years for the perpetrator to be identified after a long hunt for justice. By the year 2022, Marissa would have turned 59, possibly a grandmother and probably with her own family. She was only a little girl when her bright future was stolen from her. What would you consider to be the ideal resolution to this tragic tale then? 
let us know in the comments section. Highgate Hill is a bustling suburb located in the heart of Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. With a population of over 6,000 residents, it's a vibrant and diverse community that boasts a mix of old and new architecture, from traditional Queenslander homes to modern apartment complexes. The landscape is hilly and offers breathtaking views of the Brisbane River and the surrounding the area is known for its leafy streets, parks and gardens, making it a popular destination for families and nature lovers. However, as the case of the McCulkin family shows, even a bright and busy city like Brisbane can have a dark underbelly. Despite the beauty and charm of Highgate Hill, the case of the McCulkin family serves as a stark reminder that evil can strike anywhere at any time. Barbara McCulkin, born in 1940 in New South Wales, was a vibrant and resilient woman who faced life's challenges head-on. In June 1960, Barbara married Billy McCulkin, a small-time crook and debt collector. They had two daughters, Leanne and Vicky. Despite the hardships that came with Billy's unpredictable lifestyle, Barbara remained steadfast in her commitment to her family. She navigated the complexities of their relationship with unwavering strength and grace. Despite growing up in a difficult era, Barbara always kept her head held high and worked tirelessly to provide for her two daughters. She was a woman of many talents, from cooking and sewing to providing an education for her children. She made sure they were well-fed, well-clothed, and well-educated. Barbara truly was the epitome of a great mother. She often worked long hours at a milk bar, serving customers with a smile despite the exhaustion that she felt. Meanwhile, Billy's criminal activities only continued to escalate, causing Barbara more stress and worry. She tried her best to shield her daughters from their father's dangerous associates and activities. But it was a constant battle. Billy was hardly ever home, and when he was, he was often in a foul mood, causing tension in the household. Despite this, Barbara never gave up on her husband and tried her best to keep the family together. Barbara didn't have it easy. Living in a city like Brisbane in the 1970s, which was plagued with kidnappings, murders, and drug overdoses made life even harder for her. According to Peter Campbell, a close friend of Barbara, she was always trying to get a better job. She just lived for the kids and did a great job at that. She did a great job as a mom. Peter's stepdaughter often had sleepovers at the McCaughan house with Leanne and Vicky, who attended the same school, Uranga State School. As time went on, the financial pressure only mounted and Barbara struggled to make ends meet. And the darkness of Billy's criminal activities eventually caught up to the family. Billy the Mouse McCaughan was a notorious figure in Brisbane's underworld during the 1970s. Born in Queensland on March 15, 1940, Billy was a small, wiry man with a cunning mind and a quick temper. He was known to be a debt collector, getting money from the bookies and massage parlors and was willing to do whatever it took to make money. To make a quick buck, despite his family responsibilities, Billy's criminal activities continued to escalate and he became more deeply involved with the Clockwork Orange Gang. Billy was determined to move up in the underworld and become a powerful figure. He was known to be violent and unpredictable, and his involvement with the gang only made him more dangerous. The Clockwork Orange Gang was a notorious group of thugs in the criminal underworld of Brisbane in the 1970s. Named after the famous book and movie, they were a group of young men who believed in living fast and making easy money. Along with Billy McCaughan, the gang consisted of Vincent O'Dempsey, Peter Hall, and Gary Shorty Dubois, among others. They were known to target clubs and businesses demanding protection money in exchange for keeping them safe from harm. The gang had a reputation for using violence and intimidation to get what they wanted and they were not afraid to use extreme measures to achieve their goals. Gangs would often target clubs because they knew they would get protection money. It was a simple equation. Pay up or your club would get bombed. One of the clubs they targeted was the Whiskey Agogo. On the night of March 8, 1973, the Whiskey Agogo Club was bursting with life as Brisbaneites, business people, and even police officers all gathered inside to enjoy the vibrant atmosphere and loud music. But as the night wore on, things took a sinister turn. At precisely 2.10 a.m., two drums of diesel fuel were brutally thrown into the foyer of the club, shattering the peaceful atmosphere with a loud bang. Within moments, the drums were ignited by a lit torch that was thrown through the open door. The burning diesel fuel spread quickly and sent a plume of carbon monoxide up to the club's main room on the first floor. The heat was intense and the thick smoke made it difficult to see. The stairs were smeared with large quantities of grease, making it impossible for the patrons to escape. The door of the fire escape was also greased, which made it slippery and challenging to open. 
As the fire raged on, panic-stricken patrons tried to flee the building, but the flames had already blocked their way. The heat and smoke became unbearable and 15 people lost their lives, including waitresses, musicians, and even an off-duty police officer. The tragedy shocked the city. And a circular plaque ringed with the names of the 15 dead still sits outside the Amelia Street doorway in Fortitude Valley, serving as a stark reminder of the horrific events that occurred that fateful night. About 100 patrons, bar staff, and entertainers had been inside the club at the time of ignition. Many had to escape by jumping from broken windows onto an awning and dropping 15 feet to the ground. As the investigation into the fire began, police quickly identified two prime suspects, John Andrew Stewart and James Richard Finch. They were charged and eventually convicted of the bombing, but many believed they were framed and an inquest that could have widened the investigation was stopped after they were charged, even though it was clear that others were involved. The Whiskey A Go Go fire was a tragedy that shook the city of Brisbane to its core. The night of the Whiskey A Go Go fire, the flames didn't just engulf the club, but they also cast a dark shadow over Barbara McCawkin's heart. She had overheard the Clockwork Orange Gang discussing their plans to bomb nightclubs, including the Whiskey A Go Go, during one of their boozy meetings at Billy's home. Little did she know that her husband was deeply involved with the gang, and his actions would soon have devastating consequences. Barbara discussed this with John Ryan, a friend and security guard at the Whiskey A Go Go, who agreed to help her disappear and reveal all the secrets of the infamous Clockwork Orange Gang. The plan was to document everything on camera and recordings, and bring justice to the victim of the gang's ruthless activities. But as the night went on, John received no call. Barbara had put the plan on hold to let her daughters Leanne and Vicky attend a birthday party. The night of January 16, 1974 was filled with anticipation and fear as John Ryan, the security guard at the Whiskey A Go Go Club, waited anxiously for Barbara McCawkin's call. Meanwhile, in the streets of Brisbane, the McCawkin family's fate was already sealed. That evening, her daughters Vicky and Leanne went to Junine's 10th birthday party across the street while Barbara was alone at home. Neighborhood friends Janet and Junine Gayton saw Vince and Shorty, also known as Vincent O'Dempsey and Gary Dubois, members of the Clockwork Orange Gang, with Mrs. McCawkin at their Highgate Hill house, along with an orange Valiant Charger parked out the front. Dubois later drove the Charger to Peter Hall's house in Shermside, where he confessed that he and O'Dempsey were on the piss at the McCalkin's house and he was going back for more. As the night went on, Leon left for home from the birthday party alone at 8.30 p.m. A neighbor watched her as she entered the house. Vicky returned home as well, but this was the last time anyone ever saw the McCawkin family alive. On January 18, 1974, the eerie emptiness of the McCawkins' home was the first sign that something was amiss. Billy McCawkin, Barbara's estranged husband who had been involved with another woman, arrived to find the house abandoned. The sewing table held a dress midstitch. Barbara's purse was perched on the fridge and the cats were locked away in the bathroom. The family had vanished without a trace. Detective Sergeant Virginia Gray revealed that Billy immediately suspected his criminal acquaintances, Shorty and Vince, and confronted them with the information he had gathered from one of the girls at the birthday party. But the suspects fled town within days of the confrontation, going into hiding. Despite being prime suspects, it took until April 2, 1980 for the duo to be charged with three counts of murder. However, in 1981, the case was dropped for lack of sufficient evidence and the two men walked free. For the next 34 years, the case remained unsolved until in 2014 when new evidence emerged following the reopening of the case that year. Apparently, the Queensland Police Cold Case Unit got a tip-off that hinted that O'Dempsey and Dubois might have confessed their involvement in the murder to trusted criminal associates. Detective Sergeant Virginia Gray and Detective Inspector McDowie reopened the cold case of the McCawkin murders in 2014. They had little to go with until the tip-off was made. With that new information, Queensland Crime and Corruption Commission known as the CCC called in Peter Hall, a former criminal associate of Shorty Dubois. The CCC is an independent Queensland government entity which has the power to investigate major crimes and corruption by using coercive powers to force witnesses to give evidence, denying them the right to silence. During the interrogation, Peter Hall admitted involvement in several crimes of the past. Hall admitted to the firebombing of the Torino's nightclub in February 1973, an unsolved arson in which no one was killed. He admitted to doing break-ins as a petty criminal with his fellow Clockwork Orange Gang members Gary Shorty Dubois, Tommy Hamilton, and Keith Meredith. 
However, when the CCC pressed on, he denied any knowledge of any role that Shorty Dubois may have played in the abduction and murder of Barbara McAlkin and her daughters. What was significant about that denial was that Hall was not actually being specifically questioned at that point about the McAlkin disappearance. Also, during the interrogation, Hall let slip a comment. He said Shorty went missing the following day. Caught the attention of Detective Sergeant Virginia Gray, who realized the significance of what Hall had inadvertently revealed when she listened back to a recording of his CCC interrogation a week later. She believed that Hall was flagging that he knew Shorty Dubois had gone missing after one unspecified but crucially important day. The detectives then realized that Peter might know what happened to the McCaukin family but didn't want to do to the criminal code of silence, who would blame him. From his experience as a petty criminal in his youth, Hall was bitterly skeptical of police. He believed they were the enemy and was well aware of corrupt police officers from the bad old days of the Queensland police force, who were systematically bribed by organized criminals. So Detective Virginia Gray and Mick Dowie had to win Hall's confidence and trust. And slowly. But surely they did. Peter Hall decided to break the code of silence and reveal what he was told by Du Bois just two days after the murders. He had kept this secret for 40 years, but he decided to publicly admit his criminal past and reveal what he knew. According to Hall's confession, Barbara McCaukin and her two daughters were abducted from their home on January 16, 1974. They were taken to a remote bushland area near Warwick, two hours southwest of Brisbane, where O'Dempsey separated Barbara from her children and strangled her to death. Du Bois then assaulted at least one of the girls, and both children were murdered and buried with their mother. However, their bodies were never found. Gary Du Bois allegedly recounted that they had waited for the sun to rise so they could see what they were doing. And as the light filtered through the trees, they dug holes to bury the bodies. But it was the sight of the lifeless bodies lying there in the morning sunlight that unnerved him the most. In the aftermath of the unspeakable horror, he couldn't get out of the place fast enough. Hall describes Du Bois as a victim of circumstance, forced to comply with Odom's ES orders or face certain death himself. Anyone who got in his way at the time would have been killed, Shorty included, Hall recalls. It was a terrifying reality that Du Bois could not escape and one that ultimately led to the deaths of three innocent lives. Peter Hall recalled that Du Bois had invited him to come with them to the McCaukin house that night of the disappearance, promising him that he would have the chance to make love. Peter Hall's decision to decline Gary Du Bois' invitation to join him and Vincent O'Dempsey at the McCaukie home was perhaps the difference between life and death. The promise of making love was merely a ploy to entice Hall into joining the depraved duo on their mission to murder the family. In retrospect, it was a bullet that Hall dodged, both literally and figuratively. As Hall reflected on that fateful night, he shudders at the thought of what could have happened had he gone along with Du Bois. He wondered if he, too, would have been coerced into committing heinous acts of rape and murder against innocent children. The haunting possibility that he could have been complicit in the horrific crimes still sends shivers down his spine. But if I had, I think I would have probably been still up there now. The weight of the words and the seriousness of the situation are not lost on Hall. He understands the gravity of what could have transpired had he made a different decision that night. Looking back, Hall is grateful to have escaped the clutches of the Clockwork Orange Gang and to have lived to tell the tale. He knows that the McCaukin family was not so fortunate, and their tragic fate serves as a stark reminder of the evils that lurk in the shadows of society. Hall's confession was a significant breakthrough in the case, and Vincent O'Dempsey and Du Bois were convicted and sentenced to life in prison on June 1, 2017. Hall's decision to break the code of silence and his willingness to testify in court played a crucial role in securing the convictions. His wife's tears during the interview were likely a combination of relief and stress because her husband was taking a significant risk to bear witness against O'Dempsey and Du Bois. Warren McDonald was mentored by Vincent O'Dempsey for a period of 20 years in criminal activities. Warren's father had a history of criminal association with Vincent, and because of that connection, Vincent took Warren under his guidance and mentorship. They had worked together on several criminal ventures, including overseeing a massive illegal cannabis crop in 1997, which McDonald still vividly remembered. During the drive back to Warwick from the crop site, McDonald remembered a conversation they were having concerning a particularly difficult worker who was causing problems at the crop site. O'Dempsey then said, Oh, you need a notch on your gun. So he asked what it meant, to which O'Dempsey replied that he needed to kill to gain respect. The stunned McDonald let O'Dempsey keep on talking. That was when O'Dempsey raised the McAlkin murders.
just came straight away with it, McDonald remembers. O'Dempsey right there admitted to the McAlkin murders, saying that Shorty was nothing but an assailant and that they would never catch him as they would never find the bodies. Warren McDonald's decision to come forward and testify against Vince O'Dempsey was not an easy one as he knew the risk involved in speaking out against him. He had kept his secret about O'Dempsey to himself for the last 20 years, but he eventually decided to testify after the police had gathered enough evidence to put him in jail for years for the drug crop. McDonald's testimony was crucial in securing O'Dempsey's conviction for the McCulkin. However, McDonald's decision to testify also put him and his family in danger. O'Dempsey had allegedly planned his murder from his jail cell, and McDonald knew that O'Dempsey had a history of making witnesses disappear. McDonald feared for his life and that of his family, saying, I would be murdered, my family would be murdered, they're trying to murder me now. McDonald was determined to get the monkey off his back and bring O'Dempsey to justice. He scoffed at suggestions that he had fabricated the allegations to get off the hook, saying that the stress was unbearable and he could be murdered any day. O'Dempsey had once given him sage advice saying, if you want to live a long and healthy life, never repeat a word that'll get yourself or anyone else into trouble which now seemed ironic given O'Dempsey's situation. Peter Hall's partner at the time, Carolyn Scully, had a daughter named Carrie and who was born on July 14, 1981. Carrie and recalls Vincent being around when she was growing up a little bit at her mother's house. Vincent and her mother were seeing each other. Carrie and grew up and became a heroin addict. In the middle of 2011, Carrie and had young children and needed financial help. She called Vincent, who was then living in Warwick. Vincent gave her some money. Carrie and and her children then began living with Vincent in his house at Warwick. According to Carrie, Vincent had lots of books. He bragged to her that he had been in lots of newspapers and that he had been written about in a book. He gave Carrie and $20 to go and buy a copy of a book called Shotgun and Standover. While lying on the bed, Vincent told her he'll show her what the book said about it. According to her, he was really proud of it. O'Dempsey showed her a picture in the book of himself walking from court with a leather jacket slung over his shoulder and bragged about the McCaukin murders. A little later, he said to her, I did it and they still couldn't get me for it. Miss Scully left the relationship the next day and remained in fear of the man who she later told police was an intelligent serial killer who covered his tracks. He takes you in the middle of the night like an angel and you're gone for good, Miss Scully told a committee hearing in November 2015. The memory of that night still haunted her. The image of O'Dempsey's face etched into her mind. She knew then that he was not just an ordinary man, but a predator, a monster hiding in plain sight. Carrie Scully went into hiding, living in fear for her life, constantly looking over her shoulder, waiting for the day when O'Dempsey would come for her. But she knew that she had made the right decision, that it was better to live in fear, than to become another victim of a man who had no remorse for his heinous crimes. In the final stretch of the trial, a crucial witness emerged, adding weight to the evidence against O'Dempsey. The witness, a remand prisoner whose identity remains undisclosed, had jotted down O'Dempsey's confession on scraps of paper and crossword puzzles. The prisoner testified that O'Dempsey had said she had to be dealt with, referring to Barbara McCaukin. He had also tried to distance himself from the murders, claiming that he had never laid a hand on the children and that Shorty had committed the gruesome acts. The informant also revealed that O'Dempsey had approached him after being granted bail with an attempt to prevent the testimony of Warren McDonald and Carrie Scully in court. The informant detailed how O'Dempsey had shared information about McDonald's daily including the road he took and the roadside diner where he stopped for breakfast. The revelations left no doubt about O'Dempsey's involvement in the McAlkin case and his intention to silence witnesses. With the testimony of the final witness, the case against O'Dempsey and Du Bois was complete and the verdict seemed imminent. Vincent O'Dempsey was a 78-year-old man, born in 1937, who was currently on trial for murder in the Brisbane Supreme Court. His great-grandfather James O'Dempsey came to Warwick from Ireland in the mid-1850s and started a family that would ultimately produce a murderer. He sits upright and attentive in the dock, wearing a hearing aid to listen to the proceedings but those who know him well say that he has always been lacking in empathy and feeling. As he was diagnosed as a psychopath in his youth, Odempsey's large meaty hands and coal black eyes unnerve those who have encountered him. He has never shown any remorse for his actions and if anything, seems proud of his violent past. His former girlfriend, Carrie and Scully, testified in court that he boasted to her about his involvement in the McCaukin and even confessed to being responsible for a total of 33 murders. That would make him one of Australia's worst mass murderers, although he has not been charged for any other murders. 
there is still speculation that O'Dempsey was involved in the Whiskey Al Gogo nightclub bombing that left 15 people dead. O'Dempsey had co-opted Chorty Dubois and his which could offer a possible motive for the McCaukin murders. It is believed that the reason why Barbara McCaukin and her daughters were killed was because they feared she might reveal something she knew about the bombing of the Whiskey Ago Ago. The speculation all throughout the murder trial was that O'Dempsey and others were concerned they might be incriminated in the Whiskey murders because of their involvement in the Torino arson 11 days earlier. And for that reason, Barbara had to die. Detective Sergeant Virginia Gray told 60 Minutes that she believed Barbara knew enough to get herself into trouble. The children, unfortunately, would have placed O'Dempsey and Dubois at the scene of their mother's abduction that night. So it is suggested that is why they had to die as well. But some people like Peter Hall believe that O'Dempsey enjoyed killing for the sake of it. He believed that O'Dempsey went there that night for even baser reasons. Regardless of his motivations, O'Dempsey is a psychopath, gangster, and convicted murderer. After more than half a century, he is only now coming into focus as Australia's worst serial killer. The trial of the McCaukin murders was held in the Supreme Court in Brisbane, where Justice Peter Applegarth presided over the sentencing hearing on May 23, 2017. The court heard that modern laws allowing the court to set a parole eligibility date could not be applied retrospectively. Justice Applegarth addressed both offenders, Vincent O'Dempsey and Gary Dubois, telling them that they were cold-blooded, heartless killers who showed no remorse and would likely die in jail. He said that O'Dempsey had boasted about killing the McCulkins and getting away with it and that he was a hardened killer and criminal with no conscience. Judge Amplegarth stated that O'Dempsey had murdered a defenseless woman and was a child killer who was beyond redemption. He also said that Dubois had no conscience and was a cowardly old man who had aided O'Dempsey and continued to do so out of fear. Justice Amplegarth further explained that O'Dempsey used intimidation and traded on his reputation as a mad dog. He said that Dubois had obeyed O'Dempsey and aided in killing and assaulting the girls like a coward. However, when Dubois began talking over the sentence, Justice Applegarth told him to shut up. When he did not comply, Dubois was removed from the courtroom. The judge went on to say that the last hours of Barbara, Vicky, and Leanne's lives must have been terrifying. He said that Dubois was a coward but O'Dempsey had been the prime offender. Justice Applegarth also explained that it was clear that Barbara McAlkin knew enough about each of the pair's roles in the nightclub bombings at the time for them to want to silence her. He said that Dubois and O'Dempsey had escaped justice for decades and luck was on their side. So was the fear they installed in others. Justice Applegarth explained that the dedication of police, the testimony of dozens of witnesses, and the conscience and courage of some key witnesses at each of the trials had ensured justice at last. He told the killers that they could have no expectation of early parole. If they maintained their silence over where the bodies were buried, they could not reasonably expect to ever be granted parole. Earlier in the hearing, Justice Applegarth had allowed O'Dempsey to read a handwritten note in the court. In the note, Killer said that he had been wrongly convicted on false testimony and never had any reason to harm the McCulkins. Dubois also requested to speak but had not prepared anything in writing, so he was not able to address the court directly. Outside court, O'Dempsey's lawyer Terry O'Gorman said that his client was innocent and had been convicted on unfair testimony, including statements. However, O'Gorman acknowledged the grief and angst that the McCulkin family had been through. He extended his sympathies to the family while repeating what O'Dempsey had said, that he was innocent of these charges. In the end, Justice Amplegarth sentenced both men to life in prison. He told them that they would never be released unless they revealed the location of the McCulkin family's bodies. The judge's words echoed through the courtroom, leaving a lasting impression on all of those present. The story of Barbara McCaukin was not just a tale of tragedy and murder, but also one of secrets and hidden truths. Vincent O'Dempsey may have thought he knew everything about Barbara that fateful night, but there was one thing he didn't know. Her daughter. As a young girl of 17 years old living in Queensland, Australia, Barbara had fallen but the family of the boy wanted nothing to do with her. Neither did her parents want her to keep the baby or marry the father. And in those days, tragically, there was no option for an unmarried mother, no domestic support benefits, and nothing but shame and social pressure for having a baby out of wedlock. So she gave her beautiful newborn baby girl away for adoption in 1957. The adoptive parents renamed the baby Jocelyn and she grew up unaware of her biological family until she discovered the adoption papers hidden in her adoptive mother's bedroom cupboard in 1972 when she was 14 years old. 
Jocelyn was devastated when she finally learned the truth about her birth mother, Barbara, and her two half-sisters who were murdered. She had always felt loved by her adoptive family. But the loss of her biological family was a heavy burden to bear. You can't help but feel so sad about the whole scenario, Jocelyn lamented. They didn't do anything wrong. Just because she had some information, they didn't deserve to die. Jocelyn often wondered if her mother had been allowed to keep her, would she have ever found herself married to the detestable criminal Billy McCaughan? She also wondered if she had been with her sisters that fateful night in January 1974, would she too have been taken for a one-way drive by Vincent O'Dempsey? During the O'Dempsey murder trial, Jocelyn sat in the public gallery studying his unemotional visage as his dreadful crimes were detailed. She had hoped to see some remorse or acknowledgement of the pain he had caused her family, but he showed none. Jocelyn was philosophical about not letting Odempsey's crimes against her family get under her skin, but she wanted justice to be done. They're evil men and they don't deserve to be walking around free, she said. One mystery that remains unsolved is where Barbara and her children's bodies are buried. Jocelyn hopes that the DNA sample taken from her as Barbara's closest living relative may one day be used to confirm their location. For 45 years I've kept all that to myself, Jocelyn said, her voice trembling. My mother gave me life, so it was something that I could do for her in death and just a way of saying thank you to her. Jocelyn implores Shorty Dubois, who surely knows where the bodies are buried, to finally do the right thing. So we can have closure for everybody in the family. However, it is unlikely that Vincent O'Dempsey will ever reveal what he knows. He probably relishes the pain his final foul secret still causes. The story of Barbara McCaughan is a tragic one, but Jocelyn's hope for justice and closure continues to shine through. She may never know all the answers, but she will always honor her mother's memory and fight for the truth. On the morning of June 7, 2021, a 74-year-old man was found lying lifeless at 4.30 a.m. in his single cell at the Maribor Correctional Center in Queensland, Australia. The man was later identified as Gary Reginald Dubois, who had been convicted of the manslaughter of Barbara McCaughan and the rape and murders of her two daughters, Vicky and Leanne, in 1974. Staff and paramedics tried to revive him, but he was declared dead at 5.20 a.m. Dubois had been jailed for life in 2017 alongside co-accused Vince O'Dempsey. Both men were described as cold-blooded, heartless killers who showed no remorse for their crimes. Justice Peter Amplegarth, who presided over the case, said that the last hours of the victims' lives must have been terrifying. Du Bois was described as callous and a coward, while O'Dempsey was deemed the main offender. Du Bois' death occurred just as he was due to testify this month at a reopened coronial inquest into the 1973 Whiskey Go Go nightclub bombing. The death was a significant blow to the investigation as Du Bois' testimony could have shed light on the incident and helped to bring those responsible to justice. On May 16, 2022, Vincent O'Dempsey, a convicted triple murderer, testified at a coronial inquest regarding the 1973 firebombing of Brisbane's Whiskey A Go Go nightclub. O'Dempsey had been implicated in the attack and was asked tough questions about his involvement. He refused to take an oath or affirmation and expressed defiance throughout the proceedings. He denied any involvement in the arson and claimed not to know James Richard Finch, one of the convicted men. When questioned about the disappearance and murders of Barbara McCaughan and her daughters, he evaded the inquiries. Despite O'Dempsey's denials, there was a sense that he was withholding the complete truth. The inquests aimed to uncover further details about the attack and whether others had knowledge of it. With the conclusion of the inquest approaching, the mystery surrounding the whiskey a go, -a -go attack remained unresolved. The family of Mrs. McAlkin and her two daughters expressed relief that justice had finally been served with the guilty verdict of O'Dempsey. However, they also acknowledged that closure cannot be fully achieved until they locate the remains of their loved ones. Brian Ogden, Mrs. McAlkin's nephew, spoke on behalf of the family outside court and said, For 43 years, our families have longed for information and justice.